أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ويوم يعض الظالم على يديه يقول يا ليتني اتخذت مع الرسول سبيلا يا ويلتا ليتني لم أتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد أضلني, أضلني عن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للإنسان خذولا وقال الرسول يا رب إن قوم اتخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا وكذلك جعلنا لكل نبي عدوا من المجرمين وكفى بربك هاديا ونصيرا رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى first of all I'd like to express how happy I feel and uh, how grateful I feel to Allah عز وجل for having the opportunity to address you once again every time I come back to New York I feel I, I'm reminded of uh, just the, the wonderful people that are part of my rizq. We consider the, give, the teachers and the, the helpers and the employers and the friends, all of them are part of our rizq. Our, our sustenance is not just money and the food and the clothes and the house that we live in. That's, that's not the only thing that's our rizq. It's all the good people that Allah puts in our path, in our lives. They're also our rizq. And that's a good reminder for me personally to come back to New York. I really don't enjoy the traffic or the streets or the subways. I don't miss those, but I miss the people, alhamdulillah. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give us eternal company together in the afterlife. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today, inshallah ta'ala, about a, an observation that I've been trying to address in different ways uh, in whatever venue I can find. And this is an observation that I've made. Uh, more recently, it's become stronger, at least consciously. I've become more aware of it more recently, uh, especially after Allah Azza wa Jal gave me the honor and the ability to make Hajj this year. May Allah accept the Hajj of all the Muslims who went and all the Muslims that have done Hajj before. And may Allah give those of you that haven't had the opportunity to do Hajj yet, to give you that opportunity, inshallah uh, the, 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 the concept I want to talk to you about is actually our relationship with the Qur'an. And I know this is something you've heard about a lot of times, and it's barely, it's not one of those subjects that doesn't get a lot of attention, it gets a lot of attention. There are a lot of 
you know, talks given, a lot of reminders given about how important the Qur'an is in the life of a Muslim. And this is not going to be a new khutbah in that regard. It's the same subject of the importance of the Qur'an. But I feel there's one dimension of our relationship with the Qur'an. Because you know, when you have a relationship with this book, it has many dimensions. There are many parts of the relationship. Some parts of that relationship are highlighted. We talk about them a lot. Like even if we're not doing a good job at them. So you know, for instance, the Qur'an has a right over you and me that it should be recited every day. That it should be recited properly. That we should do our best to try to understand it. So what I understood from the Book of Allah yesterday, today it should be a little bit more. Tomorrow it should be a little bit more. Every day I should know something more about the Qur'an than I, than I did the day before. That's just something that goes, that's a standard for all Muslims, right? The recitation of the Qur'an, proper, proper recitation of it, you know, and, and understanding it better and better and trying to act on its teachings, reflecting on it, thinking deeply about its meanings. We talk about these things quite a bit. But today inshaAllah ta'ala, first I want to talk to you about the people who hear this advice all the time. And I'm, like my teacher used to say in Urdu, he used to say, sun sun ke sunni ho gaye. Right? He used to say they hear so much, they don't hear anything. <laughs> you know, the you, ah, yeah, yeah, I heard this before. That sort of thing. Allah Azza wa Jal talks about people who get reminders in the Qur'an, they get reminders and they get the best reminders. And then on top of that, they still choose to just put it aside. Like even coming to Jum'ah is just a thing you do, and then you go back to normal life. It's just one of the things in your routine. Like Jum'ah for you and me is not supposed to be, or we don't think of it as a, an experience that's supposed to transform our life. That's supposed to make our life better as Muslims. And this, these are the kinds of people that don't benefit from reminder. And in that sense, you know, we are, or not we, hopefully not us, but they're a person who doesn't benefit from reminder is not very different even from the people back in the time of the Prophet wasallam, who were listening to the word of Allah directly and they didn't care. They just moved on. Yes, Alhamdulillah, we are Muslims and they were kuffar. There's a difference there. But beyond that, in the attitude, it's a very similar attitude, isn't it? You hear the reminder, I hear the reminder, and we say, that's, how, that's cool, I think I knew that already. And then you move on, and there's no change in our behavior. But practically speaking, we didn't do anything. I mean, the complaint with the kuffar isn't just what's not in their hearts. It doesn't, nothing transforms into action. It's interesting, for example, in Meccan Qur'an, Allah doesn't just complain about the beliefs of the kuffar. He even complains about the actions of the kuffar. So on the Day of Judgment, He says about the disbeliever, فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى He didn't confirm the truth and he didn't pray. Why would you complain about a kafir not praying? Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, yes, deeds are being counted even of those who, are, who do kufr, even their deeds. How come he didn't pray? Why, how come he didn't come to believe? And if he did believe, it would have transformed into action. He would have prayed. It would have shown in, in some way. So this passage from Surah Al-Furqan that I recited to you in Arabic is one of the descriptions of Judgment Day. And Allah Azza wa Jal in His wisdom, in the previous uh, uh, ayah actually says, وَكَانَ يَوْمًا عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ عَسِيرًا That day, judgment day, is going to be difficult, especially difficult for the people who disbelieved, for the kafirin, for the people of kufr. But in this next ayah, Allah does not say, يَوْمَ يَعُضُّ الْكَافِرُ He says, يَوْمَ يَعُضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ The wrongdoer, that's the common English translation now, the wrongdoer is going to be biting his hands on that day. The wrongdoer is going to be biting his hands on that day. Now biting the hands, you may not be in the habit of biting your hands, but this is an old Arabic figure of speech. This is the way they used to say, this guy is gonna be full of regret. He's gonna be crying, wailing, he's gonna be desperate, what have I done? Now the equivalent of hold, biting your hands nowadays is somebody's holding their head like, this, oh my God, what's going on? What happened to my car? What happened to the house? What happened to my job? At that shocking moment, when you're completely full of regret, then the expression in old Arabic is used to bite the hands. So if you don't bite your hand, that doesn't actually mean that you shouldn't be able to relate to this ayah. But I tell you on judgment day, the frustration, the frustration a person goes through, that it makes them do irrational things. And you may, may have experienced some of that. If you know people that are, for example, really stressed out, or they're you know, standing outside a, hotel, a hospital room. They're the family members inside the surgery, and they're standing outside in the waiting room. Are they sitting still? No. They're walking around, they're holding their hands like this. They can't sit still. They're constantly making motions. They're, uh, they're in a state of unrest. Or they're holding their mouth when they hear the news. Judgment Day Allah describes this person is going to be biting his hands. Both of them. Not even one. Yadayhi. 
He's going to be biting on both of his hands. Why this shock and why this, this, this regret? He says, Allah Azza wa describes, يَقُولُوا يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا If only I had taken a path, if I only had taken a lifestyle alongside the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, يَا لَيْتَنِي آمَنْتُ بِالرَّسُولِ No, no, no. If only I believed in the Messenger. That's not what it says. It says, if only I took a path along with the Messenger. What is being highlighted here is not that just we accept the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa which we already do, alhamdulillah. But actually that we pick up the lifestyle of this man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That we pick up his habits, his mannerisms, his character, the way he was grateful, the way he was kind to people, the way he smiled at others the way he dealt with others in business, the way he dealt with non-Muslims, the way he dealt with Muslims, the, day, the way he dealt with elders, the way he dealt with young people, the way he dealt with the wife, the way he dealt with the friend. This is his path. This is a sabil, the modern translation of sabil, if you will. It's not a linguistic translation, it's a sociological translation, would be lifestyle. If only I had a lifestyle alongside the messenger. If I lived the way he lived, if I took that path. But the word path also means something else. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the one hand came to make us better people, to make us realize how good human beings can actually be. But at the sec on, the, uh, uh, on a second note, he also came to put us on a mission. To not just become better people ourselves, but to help the rest of humanity become better people. That's part of the mission of our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's a long road, that's a sabil. So not only do you change yourself, now you identify because of that change in yourself with that mission, and you want to share that goodness with the rest of humanity. Before I go on, I want to share with you why I'm having these thoughts. Why am I referring specifically to what happened after Hajj? How is this tied to what happened after Hajj? Hajj obviously is an expression of people's iman. It is not easy to go to Hajj. It's a huge financial strain. Some people save their entire life and they can't go. You know, I was, I, we were particularly sad this last year because the Syrian government didn't allow the Syrian Muslims to come. And usually there's a huge delegation of Muslims from Syria that go to Hajj every year. But they weren't even allowed to come to Hajj. May Allah Azza wa Jal relieve them from the tyranny and the suffering that they're going through. And may Allah alleviate them and the shuhada among them, may Allah accept them. But you know, when you go to Hajj, you see people that are 92 years old. Uh, you, you start feeling tired and you see a 100 year old guy jog by you and you're like, oh, I should be ashamed, I should, you know. Subhanallah, these people are making Hajj for the first time in their life. And they're, they're, they're having this grand up. Allah has invited them. So it's obviously a show of Iman. But you know what? At the same time, it's not just supposed to be a show of Iman. It's supposed to be a show of our loyalty to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's ironic to me, it's particularly ironic that the Messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam, one of his missions was to clean up the house of Allah. One of his missions was to clean up the idols, get rid of them, and clean the house of Allah so only Allah can be worshipped at the Kaaba. That was one of his missions. And when you go and you find Muslims, forget cleaning the idols, that's a, that's a far problem for us. Well, you have Muslim, hujjaj, people that are doing hajj, knowledgeable people, educated people, drinking a bottle of water and chucking it on the street. Right, and they're going like, they're not waiting for a trash can or something, somebody eats a banana peel, throws it down. You go, you, you, when you leave Muzdalifah, when you leave the field of Muzdalifa the next morning, it looks like a trash dump. You can't step without stepping on trash. You can't do it. And this, these are people who believe this is sacred territory. Right? It's shocking. That's shocking to me. Nobody will go to the Washington Monument. Nobody's gonna go to the 9-11 Memorial and throw a Pepsi can. Nobody's gonna do it. That's sacred ground. This is something a nation respects. We should have you know, you know, dignity for this place. But you go to Mina and you go to Muzdalifa and you go... Even in the streets of Mecca, what do you find? You find trash. And who's throwing that trash? Don't blame the government. Oh, this, you know, the Saudi government's doing... What? There's millions of Muslims. We're the ones. We don't even have the simple etiquette of the Messenger's lifestyle sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of how much he cared about being clean. How much he cared about not, cre not being a source of adding to the, the filth in a society, spiritually and physically speaking. And physically speaking. And yet, we, at the same time, we can say that we went for the sake of Allah. So there's a disconnect in our minds. There's a disconnect between what we think we're doing for Allah, and what we're actually supposed to be doing for Allah Azza wa Jal. You can't keep that, we have to bridge that disconnect. We have to become people that embody, that live the example of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, not just in the ibadat, not just in the acts of doing hajj, 
Not just in the act of making salat. Not just in the act, you know, and, and you know, uh, there are so many times announcements are made, I don't know if they're made anymore, inshallah they're not, about people parking their cars improperly or blocking other people's driveways. Brother, if you come for Jum'ah, don't park your car improperly, don't park on other people's lawns and things like that. You know, all over the country these announcements are made. Isn't it like a sunnah of our Messenger وسلم, to worry about the rights of the neighbor? Isn't that a sunnah? Like weren't the, peop- the neighbors of the Rasul وسلم, extremely happy with him? You know, they, they, the best of neighbors, the best of friends. And if there was ever something wrong, then it was done by the neighbors, never by him. How many times he gave us wasiya to take care of our neighbors? And you go around the country and you'll find people that are in the neighborhood of the masjid in America. Educated Muslims, right? You can't even say, oh, this is the ignorance of the Muslims that don't have a good education. All across America, you have big masjids that are built. And guess who's really unhappy by the masjid? The entire neighbor. The, all the, the whole neighborhood is unhappy. Why are they unhappy? Oh, because they hate the Muslims and these kuffar? No, because we park on their lawns. Because we block their, their driveway. Because we don't care when we make a mess. That's why. And then even in the months, the, the, you know, a couple of months down the road, inshallah ta'ala, the month of Ramadan is coming. May Allah give us the risk of Ramadan once again. <coughs> when the month of Ramadan is coming, we go have iftars. The, even the masajid hold iftars. Even the, I'm talking about the religious community. We hold iftar. And what do we do? How much food is wasted? Every time. How many bags of garbage and how much food is in those bags of garbage? Is this the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is this what we're supposed to be doing? And then we complain about the state of the ummah. We're not even taking care of the simplest things that mean that we are following the path of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This guy will regret it on judgment day. You know, we talk about the high goals of Islam, how we have to give Islam to America, how we have to give Islam to the world. I believe in those goals. But you know what? I also believe in you can't talk about the hundredth floor until you enter the first floor. <laughs> We're still in the basement. We haven't even come to the first floor yet. We have to deal with the basics, the fundamentals. And fundamentally, our deen requires us to become responsible people, ethical people, people that care about their surroundings, people that care about their family members, their neighbors, their, their neighborhoods. This is what they do. I should not go into any masjid, any, even masajid. I should not go into any masjid and see people like, you know, uh, uh, they take their shoes off and they just throw them wherever and they go. Why? You go to, do you do this in anybody else's house? Would you do this if you go to somebody's house? They invite you as a guest to their house and you take your shoes off and you just throw them wherever? Would you do that? It's a show of disrespect, isn't it? Isn't it? And here we are, guests of the house of Allah. Here we are, Allah invited us to this house. This is not your house, this is not my house, this is Allah's house. It deserves respect. It deserves some, something, some sentiment is supposed to be inside of us. That we show it this honor, you know. The way we carry ourselves, the way we greet with each other. These are small, small things I'm talking about. But they're not impossible for us to change. We just don't even think about them when we think about Islam. We just think Islam is about, you know, you should, you should recite more and more of the Qur'an, which I believe you should. You should memorize as much of the Qur'an as possible, I believe you should. Absolutely. But you know what? The more Qur'an we recite, the more it becomes a hujjah on us that we change ourselves. That we change the way we carry ourselves. That we have a different tone in our speech. That we have a different level of brotherhood among each other. How many Muslims come to the masjid? You guys come every Jum'ah you come, probably every Jum'ah you're at this masjid. And when you come and as you're leaving, how many people that you don't know you say salam to with a smile? Or are you just looking at the guy like, Where is he gonna, when's he gonna get out of the way saying, get to my shoes, man, I gotta get out of here. Is that your attitude? You know, you're, you're together as people of La ilaha illallah. There should be a natural love among you. And that's something the Messenger put inside the believers. You know, فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ He put love between your hearts. I don't even know you as a Muslim. I shouldn't give you a dirty look. Just because you're in New York and the dirty look is standard, doesn't mean you give a dirty look to another Muslim. You know, I know you're living in Queens, I understand, I lived here too. And I know it, when you go outside of New York, and you're walking down a street in North Carolina, or like Memphis, Tennessee, and some random stranger with a cowboy hat on looks at you and goes, how's it going? Nice day, isn't it? You're like shocked, why is this guy smiling? Has he got, like, has he got a gun in his pocket or something? Why is he smiling at me? And then you realize those people are closer to the, a prophetic way. The Prophet ﷺ, his standard was to be smiling, not to be frowning. You know, to be friendly to others, to care for others, to look, look out for others. These are the kinds of things we have to value and bring back into our communities, into our personal lives, 
into our characters. So the, the, this believer says on that day, I wish I had taken a, a path, a lifestyle along the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya wailata. One of the great scholars of the, the Arabic language, Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan al I'm very impressed with his work. You know, he described in one of his lectures the difference between Ya Waylati and Ya Waylata. And actually, normally you say Ya Waylati, and this has been Asalib al Ta'ajjub, he says. It's from the forms of shock. When you see something, you can't believe what's happening, you say Ya Waylati. Actually, even nowadays in modern Arabic, they say Ya Wayli when something shocking happens. But the ta is used to express even more shock, and when that shock is actually mixed, mixed with sadness, when there's hasra in it, when there's huzun in it, when there's gham in it, when there's bath in it, when there's sadness mixed into, the, into your cry, then you say, Ya Wayla Ta. And that's what the ayah begins. Then it says, Laytani. If only. There's two kalimat, of, one of shock and one of like depression. Why did I mess up? I had such an opportunity to be to make better decisions, and I'm looking back now, and I couldn't have done it. The Urdu, you know, in English, it's not really a word. We say, "Oh, if only." That's the expression for later. The Arabic, you know, the Urdu speakers they say "akash," but even who uses "kash" anymore? Most of your kids don't know what "kash" means, right? But it's looking back in sadness. Laytani, oh, if only. And what does he say? Looking back, "Lam attakhid fulanan khalila." Beautiful words. He says, if only I didn't take so-and-so, some dude as a friend. Look at this. Ar-Rasul, in the previous ayah. I should have been alongside the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And in the next line he says, man, I wish I didn't take that guy as my friend. Which guy? The guy that took you away from the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The guy that made you do things that the messenger would never do, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The friends that made you talk in a way that the messenger would never approve of, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You have those kinds of friends. There are some of you that are good people, but you have bad friends. And when you hang out with your friends, you become bad people. And you will not be able to blame your friends on that day like this guy is doing. It won't work. And by the way, those friends are so useless, even though you call them every day, you check their Facebook posts every day, you text them every day, you check their tweets every day, you're following them on Twitter, you care about them today. But on judgment day, you can't even remember the guy's name, you call him Fulan. Fulan means so and so, etc, etc. What was that guy's name again? That's how this is described on Judgment Day. In the previous, and by the way, on that day, because you didn't care about the Messenger وسلم, in this life, in this life, the Messenger was nobody to you. But then the Messenger is Ma'rifah, Ar-Rasul. Ya laytani, you know, Ya'udhu al-Zalimu ala yaday. Qala, you know, Ittakhathu ma'ar-Rasuli sabila. I took a path, if only I took a path with the Messenger. But when it comes to his actual friend, he can't even remember his name. That's, that's the reality of those kinds of friends. You won't even know their names when Judgment Day comes. They'll just be a fulan to you. Fulan just means so and so. That's what they'll be, be to you and to me. We have to make a really good assessment of who our friends are and what kind of lifestyle they're leading us down. Wallahi, I don't speak from theory. I'm tell, I know good brothers, good brothers, that I used to meet, they used to be the first people at the Salat of Fajr at the Masajid. There used to be people that were pioneering some of the like work, da'wah work at MSAs and putting volunteer work together and humanitarian efforts and this and that and the other. And then something happened and they got into the bad company with their friends and you, they disappeared. They just disappeared. And what took them away? The wrong kind of friend. The wrong kind of friends. That's it. That's all it was. Bad company. Those people are not your friends. Get that through your heads. Especially the young guys that are sitting here. Those guys are not your friends. You know the guys that use foul language? And you're like, you realize it's a bad thing to hear or say. So you don't say it, like, at least, I mean they say it, but I don't say it. No, it has an impact on you. It's tearing your soul down from the inside. It's eating away at you. And eventually, they will pull you away. And eventually those words will come out of your mouth. You know, Al-ina'u bima fihi yandah, they say in Arabic. A container only gives out what it contains. If bad words are going into your ears, bad words are come, gonna come out of your tongue. If you're seeing evil all the time going in, then evil actions will come out. They'll come out, they don't just stay in. You can't just pretend that the things you watch, and the things you hear, and the places you go, will not have an impact on your character, they will. And we don't want to be of those people who regret having the wrong kinds of friends on Judgment Day. This is a, what this means then is, you and I have to make a solid effort to find people, find the company of people that make us more respectable, 
They make us more, they make our manners better. They make our speech better. They make us more courteous. They make us more patient. You know, they make us, you know, better people. And my personal advice to you is if you have elders in your family, spend more time with them. You'll learn patience. You will learn patience. And if you have, a, if you, and if you have an ego problem, if you have a pride problem, spend a lot of time with your parents because they will put you down all the time and it'll burn you and you'll become humble. Spend a lot of time with your parents. I know you don't like spending time with your parents because your dad's always telling you stuff. And you're like, oh, I want to hear this. It's good for you. It's good for you. It will make you, it builds your character, it builds your humility. Now, there's a reason Allah told us to spend time with our parents. And there's a reason Allah told us to be patient with them. Allah does not tell us to be patient with our friends. He doesn't give us a specific ayah in the Quran to be patient with anybody else, but with, pa with parents. With parents. And He tells us patient, be patient with the enemies of Islam, and He tells us to be patient with parents. Why? Because parents can say things that test your patience. Allah knows. Allah knows. And that's why He told you to do it. And it, it builds your character. Anyhow, coming back to this beautiful passage, لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي He made me, he miss, he made me slip away from the remembrance, the Qur'an, after it had come to me. It doesn't even say عَنْ ذِكْرٍ He said أَذْ ذِكْرٍ Even Qur'an he remembers specifically. The Qur'an used to be recited, there were halaqat being offered. I, was, I could have been in company that could have brought me closer to Allah's word, and therefore closer to becoming a better person. But I said, nah, go to the Qur'an halaqah or go catch a movie tonight. I don't know. I'll just go catch a movie. He kept putting me away from the remembrance. Even after it had come to me, بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي You don't even have to go to the remembrance, it comes to you. By the way, this part of the ayah is even more true today than it was then. Back then, somebody might hear the Qur'an, somebody might hear the Messenger wasallam, and somebody might not hear. But today there is no excuse. How many apps, how many downloads, how many books, how many websites, how many YouTube videos that you can access Allah's message? That you can access explanations of the Qur'an, recitation of the Qur'an, you know? There's no excuse, it's coming to you, it's coming to you, and you're ignoring it, and you're saying, no, I'd rather search for something else. I'd rather go some other way. And this guy on Judgment Day is blaming his friend for doing so. وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا Very interesting word Allah uses. Allah's commentary at the end, some say this is Allah's commentary at the end, shaitan, when it comes to the human being especially, is khadul. Khadul is a kind of friend who leaves you at the right moment. Like you, the, the, there's a friend who always like, he's hanging out with you, he's chilling with you, he's your bro. You know, you, you know, he's always there for you until the time comes when you need him. And when the time comes when you need him, he's gone. Nowhere to be found. And when the time of need is over, then he's back again, he's your bro again. That kind of friend is called khadul. Allah says that's what shaitan is. He's always there with you. And you don't, you don't see shaitan. It's not like the cartoon shaitan with the horn sticking out and the tail in the back and a pitchfork. That's not shaitan. Shaitan comes to you in waswasa. Shaitan comes to you through your friend. Shaitan comes to you through your screen on your, your mobile device. That's how he comes to you. And he, he says, I'm, I'm giving you what you want, bro. I'm looking out for you. Until judgment day shows up and he leaves you and you're like, where'd he go? I thought I was doing this for myself. I thought he was looking out for me. This is the, this is the trickery of shaitan. Don't be fooled that the, the urges you have the, you know, and all young men have urges, they have temptations, they have feelings inside that are raging. And shaitan comes and says, come on, act on your feelings. Come on, it's no, not that bad. It's not that bad. You, you could do whatever you want. It's not so bad. And we fall into that trap. And this is, this is the khadal of shaitan. This is the deception of shaitan. That he, he'll leave us on the right moment, he just gives us so much motivation to do the wrong thing. To just get us to that point. And this guy is giving, this is not, Allah is recording the speech of an average person who ignored the reminder. And he's, he's giving the khutbah now, on judgment day. Oh man, shaitan got me. لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي وَكَانَ شَيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا And this is the ayah that I want to conclude with. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبْ If that's, all of this wasn't bad enough, the Messenger himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks to Allah directly, Ya Rabb, inna qawm ittakhadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. This nation of mine, no doubt about it, 
they took this Qur'an, هَذَا Quran. Even there, there's a beauty in even the use of the word هَذَا here, as opposed to ذَلِكَ Like when you start reciting Qur'an in the beginning, أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ Here Allah does not say ذَلِكَ Quran. He says هَذَا Quran, هَذَا لِلْقَرِيب This Qur'an was right here, it was right in front of you, and you still wouldn't take it seriously. And the Messenger on Judgment Day وسلم, complains, this nation of mine took this Qur'an, not that Qur'an, this Qur'an, one of the other rhetorical benefits, balaghi benefits of the word hadha in this ayah is on judgment day, it will be like the Qur'an will be brought as a witness. You know how in court, you bring the witness, and then the witness is, or the evidence is brought, and you point at the evidence and say, this is the evidence that that guy is a criminal. So the, ev- the evidence itself will be the Qur'an on judgment day. Your case is bad enough as it is. And then the Qur'an is brought as the witness, and the attorney making, bringing the evidence is the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he's pointing at the Qur'an and saying, these people, this nation of mine, they took this Qur'an, mahjura, they took it mahjuran. Hajara, they say in Arabic, taraka shay'an. Oh, uh, it's uh, hajartahu hajran, yani taraktahu, aghfaltahu. You made something forgotten. You completely ignored something. You left it way behind. I think even the Urdu speakers here know the word hijra. Everybody knows the word hijra. To migrate something. The, the ayah doesn't even say matrukan. Matrukan means left behind. Mahjuran means left way behind. They didn't just leave the Qur'an, they left it way behind. They, had, they weren't even close. They just migrated away, away, away from it. And I, I want to remind myself and all of you today, the character that the Qur'an wants from us, if we are away from that, even though we're reciting the Qur'an, it's still a hijrah from the Qur'an. It's still a hijrah from the Qur'an. We're migrating away from the Qur'an if we're reciting it, and we're not seeing any change in our character. That's, that's the quality of Bani Israel. And that's why this, this by the way, is Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th Surah of the Qur'an. It's not a long surah, so you can read it in translation when you go home. What's remarkable about this surah, this is the middle of it. When you get to the end of it, the whole ending is about what kind of character is required from a Muslim. What should the personality of a Muslim look like? Why is that mentioned when the messenger complained they abandoned the Qur'an? Because the person who does not abandon the Qur'an has a different kind of personality. Their personality is different, their character is different, their actions are different, even who they hang out with is different. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا In the same surah, when they walk by useless conversation, they walk by in a dignified way, they don't get entangled in it. They, they, they stay away from useless company even. It affects every part of their personality. That's the abandonment of the Qur'an. I feel that the ummah is becoming, and you and I are becoming more and more and more guilty of, and we have to be worried about it. I was reading this ayah, my, my daughter recites Qur'an to me at home. And she was reading this ayah, and I was just checking her tajweed, and she's reciting the ayah, and I sat there and I started crying. And she said, Abba, why are you crying? I said, because of what Allah said. You know, because of what Allah said. She said, what did He say? And I said, you know, He says, the messenger will complain about a group of people who left the Qur'an. And she says to me, but we didn't leave the Qur'an, we're reading it. And I said, beta, if only it was just about reading, it would have been easy. It's not just about reading it. You have to love this, can we, can we prove to ourselves we love this book more than any other movie that comes out? More than any video game? Do we, spend more t- do we want to spend more time with this book than anything else? Do we want to be like what this book wants us to be? More, like, more than we want to be like anyone else or anything else? How you younger guys want to look like ripped because they see a picture of a guy with muscles? Girls want to look like someone? People want to make money like someone? People idolize these people? Who idolizes the character that the Qur'an embodied? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. Who like, goes to sleep at night saying, Man, I wish I had a six pack. Instead of thinking, Man, I wish I had more sunnah in my life. Who says that? Who, well, how are we not abandoning it? How are we not abandoning it? We have to be a people that take coming back to Allah's book seriously. May Allah Azza wa make us a people that love this book and make it a big part of our lives so everything in our life is given blessing and given life through the barakah of this book. May Allah Azza wa help the Muslims understand this book as they should understand it. May Allah help you as parents not only love and understand this book yourselves, but give you the ability to teach it to your children, so your children can testify for you on Judgment Day. May Allah Azza wa Jal help the masajid, the schools, the, the madaris of hifz, all these kids that are memorizing Qur'an. May Allah not just help them memorize Qur'an, but to help them understand every word of it, and to live that word of it, and to pray with their hearts, not with 
their tongues when they pray. May Allah make us of those people that really live the Qur'an and the Qur'an lives inside their hearts. بَلْ هِيَا بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ These are ayat that live in the chests of those who've been given knowledge. Chests, the Qur'an lives in the person's heart. May Allah enter this Qur'an into all of our hearts. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ وَنَفَعْنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِالْآيَاتِ وَذِكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم ما في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا